and as we continue to talk to see how we will put the mortal remains of our dear mother, the soul departed to rest. I received another message of the demise of another member of the church. That kind of hit me so hard. And so I started praying to God. I know death is inevitable. But we wish that we will live long and even longer. In my prayer, the Lord ministered to me, go back and tell them, just go back and tell them that I love them. And so I'm back here to share this same message with you. You may have heard it from me before, but today I believe the Spirit of God wants to bring a deeper meaning to us. And that is why I pleaded with pastor and the permanent leadership to yield the podium to me. And maybe next week, you will come with your message. But God has sent me to you with this message. The manifestation of God's love by the Holy Spirit. You see, God is love and he loves us so much. But without the spirit of God working in you, it will be difficult for you to understand the depth of God's love. There are several benefits that come to us when we come to faith. They come to us through the ministration of the Holy Spirit that we receive as a seal of divine ownership. But one of those benefits is the pouring out of God's love into our hearts. Now, this pouring out of God's love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit it's very, very critical in our Christian walk because it actually moves us from a place of intellectual knowledge into an experiential one. Without that, you may read about God's love and when you read the Bible it tells us there are several biblical references that talks about God's love towards us and as you read them you gather head knowledge but how do you translate this into your everyday experience that comes through the ministry of the Holy Spirit So the spirit presence in us helps us to receive a continued witness to Christ so that as we reflect him in character, we also grow deeper in God's love. And this provides us with the assurance that regardless of what we go through, God has loved us and he continues to love us. And it provides us with the courage to endure present sufferings and problems and difficulties and afflictions in life. And we endure them in the knowledge of future reward. And I say it again that it is the ministry of the Holy Spirit and I'm praying that even as we continue to serve the Lord, the Spirit will minister to us. Amen. 
You see, God's purpose is to create a wonderful family of free persons. People who are his own. So when we trust him as Lord and Savior, he sends his spirit into our hearts. And through the spirit, he continues to pour his love. So that what we know by knowledge becomes experiential. What I mean is God's love at this point will not be an abstract thing. But it becomes real. It becomes real. And there is a reason. Romans chapter 5. Verse 1 to 5. Romans chapter 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Hallelujah. So in this passage, we are informed that placing faith in Jesus brings you to a place of acceptance. That is what we call justification. It means that your sins are forgiven. And God considered, considers you as somebody who has never sinned. And this also brings that peace of mind because you know that between you and God, there is no issue. But as we continue to read, it says that we also glory in tribulation in suffering, suggesting that the fact that you have been saved does not mean you will not go through suffering. You will not go through trials. But it says you are able to react positively in it because there is hope for you. And hope is not actually for today. Hope is for tomorrow. And the reason why you are able to rejoice in the suffering is that God has poured his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So there is the love of God in you. And with this understanding that God lo has loved me, then I will conclude that what I am going through today is not as a result of his rejection because he has already loved me. And if he has loved me and understanding his love, then I know that regardless of what the circumstances may be, God is up to something. Amen. Praise God. But for us to have a very good understanding of this portion of scripture, we may have to move on to read from verse 6 to 11. Understanding verse 6 to 11 will help you to actually understand what he is saying here in verse 1 to 5. So we'll move on to verse 6 to 11. Now it reads from the NIV. You see, at just the right time, 
when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Then he says, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. No, for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. Watch this. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Hallelujah. Now, the message here is that salvation put us right with God. But God's love is the root from which comes all the redemptive grace. And it is demonstrated by the giving of his son Jesus Christ to die for sinners. And he goes on to explain that the redemptive work of Christ has guaranteed our future with God. And that is the hope we have. The hope that the saved shall be saved. But this one is based on the historical act of Jesus. His sacrifice on the cross of Calvary which took place some 2,000 plus years ago. This is a historical fact. And it was a pure demonstration of God's love. And verse 7 shows that Christ dying for us on the cross surpasses all forms of love that can be expressed. The fact is, a person willing to die for a righteous man or a good man is very difficult. So, it says, verse 7, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. What is trying to suggest that within human relationship, Nobody would want to throw his life out there for another. But there may be that possibility. And it may come when there is the realization that the person that I would want to take a bullet for is so superior and that his continued presence here would impact more lives than myself. Hello? So here is the lesser attempting to substitute for the greater. Correct? And that is why in our world we have some people who are you know, specially trained to take bullets for president. Because they want to protect that person. They see that person as the first gentleman of the land. And so even if 10 people should die for that person, they believe it's okay. But he says, in our case, it is the opposite. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. Go to verse 8. But God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, so we weren't righteous. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Can we go to verse 9? Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So what he's saying is that the exchange that took place 
on the cross of Calvary was not an inferior one dying for superior. But it was the superior one, the supreme one, God who knew no sin, dying for the sinner. If somebody attempts to die for a good man, it is the inferior trying to protect the superior. But for God to die for the sinner, this is beyond human comprehension. And that is why the song says, I do not know why Jesus died for me. Because if you want to investigate it, you will never find the answer within the realms of the scope of human understanding. As a matter of fact, you have to tap into the sovereign will of God. But he did it. Praise God. He did it. If you ask me why God did it, I cannot fully explain. And I've said that we can only find the answer in the sovereign will of God himself. Because there was nothing good in us. We were not righteous. We were not good. The Bible says, at the right time, when we were powerless, when we were ungodly, when we were still sinners, and then as if that was not enough, when we were God's enemies. So who would actually exchange his life for his enemies? I've come here to explain to us that no matter what you go through, the fact that you have been saved is enough demonstration of God's love towards you. So we, yes, we may pray for certain things, but we don't need any other thing that is so superior to demonstrate God's love than his death on the cross of Calvary. If I'm sick and I pray for healing and he grant unto me, praise God. But if he does not, I believe the most precious, the supreme one has already been given. It has already been given. Chapter 4 verse 25. Romans chapter 4 verse 25. Who was delivered up because of our offenses? And was raised because of our justification. Can you go back to verse 24? Verse 24. But also for us, it shall be imputed to us who believe in him, who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up. Christ was delivered up. He was given up because of our offenses, not because we were good, not because we were so much polished that if he doesn't save us, his kingdom will crash. And I'm saying that this is all historical facts. But they must become real in our lives. And so when we believe in him, I'm going back, he says, he sends his spirit into our hearts. And through his spirit, he continues to pour his love because now it was his love that brought Jesus into this world to die as my savior. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But this love which prompted him to bring his son to die must actually become real in our lives. So when we place faith 
in him, the spirit comes to live in us and then continues to witness Christ. Now, not from outside, but from within. So deep down on the inside, you know, you have that inner conviction, that inner assurance that I am loved by God. I am loved by God. Brought Jesus to die as my Savior. His love for me. Brought Jesus to die on the tree. His love for me is bring me nearer to glory one day I will know of the death of his love for one day I will know of the death of his love for me. Brothers and sisters, without this inner witness of the Holy Spirit, about the love of God, in our souls, in our spirit, we can be Christians all right, but we'll be miserable. And we'll be questioning so many things that go on in life and around us. The reason is that to be saved does not guarantee absence of trial. To be saved does not guarantee absence of trouble. It doesn't guarantee absence of pain. It doesn't guarantee absence of sorrow. It doesn't guarantee absence of afflictions of all kind. What the Bible says is that the afflictions of the righteous are many. But the good news is still that God would deliver you from them all. In James chapter 1 verse 2, the Bible suggests that we will encounter all kinds of trials or troubles. James 1 2. And when you read the New Living Translation, James 1 and verse 2. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, he's talking to Christians, and he's not saying if. He's saying when, which suggests a matter of time. It talks about the inevitability of it. When? So if it is not here today, it might come tomorrow. When trouble comes. So here the Bible is saying that you are Christians, you are saved all right. But troubles, afflictions, challenges, difficulties in life are inevitable. But knowing that God has loved me and he continues to love me will enable you to pass through. Amen. Praise God. Again, in John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus hinted that in this world, we would have many troubles. He says, I have told you these things so that in me, you may have peace. In this world, you would have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So the troubles are there. But once you know that you are an overcomer in him, you'll be at peace. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So suffering is there. 
And there are so many things that will not be solved completely in this life. So many questions. For instance, why should the Christian suffer? Why all these things? Why? Why should a Christian suffer? Did he not say, come unto me, all ye who are heavily laden, and I will give you rest? Yes! Yes, we have, we have been given rest. Rest from meritorious works. Attempting to work your way to please God. That one, nobody can ever achieve it. And Christ Jesus took our place and he did it for us. So that now I have been credited with all the acceptability of Christ. Praise God. So I am saved not by the observance of law, but by grace. Praise God. But there is another form of yoke that I put on myself, which is not burdensome. But let me give us some several reasons why we go through suffering. Sometimes we suffer simply because we are human. Our bodies change as we grow older. And we are susceptible to the normal problems of life. You see, the same body that can bring us pleasure can also bring us pain. Because we are growing. Praise God. I was telling a cross section of believers that whether you are young, like our sisters and brothers, when you call them to come and sing, you see the speed, and they can jump, but, 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 they are here. If I should call any of our mothers, you have to climb the stairs sideways, correct? You begin to go like this. <laughs> Praise God. What is telling you to do that? Changes in your body. That comes as a result of what? You go through pain. And... This one will not spare you because you are a Christian. You have to learn to manage it. They are part of human life. Hallelujah. We also have natural disasters that can alter the course of our lives. We can suffer because, watch this. We are reckless and disobedient to the Lord. Our own rebellion may afflict us. Or the Lord may see fit to discipline us in his love. Then God in his grace forgives our sins. But in his government, he must permit us to reap what we sow. So sometimes you sin. You pray God will forgive you. By the repercussions. And that can also create suffering in life. But sometimes too, we suffer for doing the will of God. And that is where the mystery is. As somebody say, as for this one, I can't think far. And this is what we call the afflictions of the righteous. So, the suffering is not coming as a result of bad deeds. It's not coming as a result of a reckless life, but it's coming as a result of you being a righteous person, walking in the way of the Lord, doing the will of God. That is what we call baptism of suffering. First Peter chapter 3. Verse 13 to 18. First Peter chapter 3. Can you put the NIV? Correct, 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 correct. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? All right, this is a question. But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threat. Do not be frightened. 
But in your heart, revere God, Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Mm -hmm. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Praise God. So here in this passage, the writer uses a paradox. He asks a question in verse 13. Can you go back to verse 13? Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? That is the question. Then he provides the answer by bringing a contrast in the next verses. Verse 13 and 14. Now, but even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threat. Do not be frightened. So the first question, verse 13, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? Now, the harm here he's talking about, within you know, the context of God's wisdom, the answer is no. Nobody can harm you for doing what is right. But it says, even if they harm you, even if they harm you, do not fear their threats. So he is considering that harm, the second one, as what? Threat. So do not fear. What is he trying to say? What kind of sufferings do we go through as Christians? That God wants us to understand that he loves us and we have a future. So the sufferings that we go through for being Christians should not actually cause us to withdraw. But we should rather persevere. Amen. What kind of suffering is that? Let's go to Matthew chapter 10 verse 28. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Watch this carefully. Do not be afraid. So he's saying that all the harm that the enemy can do for you or to you as a Christian, as a child of God, who is living your life upon the precept of God's word, standing on your faith, in your faith, promoting God's agenda, doing the will of God. If the enemy charges against you, all that he can do is to kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Praise God. So sickness, you may be afflicted with sickness, and all that you can do is to harm the body. But the real you is the soul. Amen. But it says that if you have to be afraid of anybody, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Who is this person? Jesus Christ. But when we place faith in him, we are saved. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So when I understand this, I accept and I draw the conclusion that because my faith has found a resting place, nobody can harm me. All you can do is to afflict the body. But even when death occurs, death means discontinuance. It means what? Discontinuance. It is, it is a message to the soul to exit the body. Because the body is called earthly vessel. It's like the vehicles that we drove to church. When you got here, it is your destination. You parked your car and got off your car. But if you have to go back, then you enter your car. At that point, you and your car, you are one. But when you exit, there's a separation. Praise God. But the real you is the soul. So all that the enemy can do is to harm the body. But he cannot kill the soul. I remember a conversation that took place between God and Satan. Where are you coming from? From wandering around. 
What about my server Job? Have you considered him? Oh, why do you ask me this question? Ask for Job. He doesn't fear you for nothing. No. You have blessed him and you have built a hedge around him. Please allow me. Let me deal with this guy. God said, okay, that is fine. But as for his soul, you cannot touch. So yes, Job was afflicted, but I believe Job was ahead of his contemporaries. He understood this principle. And that's why when he was stripped of naked, everything taken away from him, the Bible says, he said, the Lord gave it. The Lord take it. May his name be praised. Praise God. You see, he loves you. He loves you. He's a loving father. It is difficult to fully understand God's love. And that's why it takes the presence of the Holy Spirit working in us to know this. Therefore, Paul writes in our key text, Romans chapter 5, verse 1 to 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. We are standing in grace and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. We boast in the hope of the glory of God. That when we have appeared before him, we shall be like him. We shall be like him. We shall reflect him. We shall radiate his glory. Praise God. And wherever he is, we shall be. That is our boast. That is our comfort. That is our hope. Because now we know that by this justification, we have peace. We have what? <laughs> what does it mean? All right, let me take time and break it down. But let me finish reading. Verse 3, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. We also glory in our sufferings. Now somebody will ask, who is in his right frame of mind who glory in sufferings? He is the person who knows that I am loved by God. And I have future with him. Praise God. Otherwise, somebody will not lose the wife, lose the children, and then receive the message, and then he will sit in his seat, and he begins. The first thing that came out of his mouth, when peace like a river and that my way, when so rose like sea below Whatever my Lord Thou hast taught me to say It is well ah, It is well With my soul It is well He's lost the children wife is gone everything taken away from him but he says we my soul oh hey, it is well hey, it is well ah, it is well it is well is on the inside
therefore since we have been justified through faith we have peace with God so he's saying that the first great benefit we enjoy as people who have been justified by God is peace through Jesus Christ the Holy Spirit continually reminds us that by faith in Jesus, the war is over. There is no more enmity between us and God. Christ has removed that enmity. Between me and God, everything is alright. You see, even if Satan attacks, his goal is to cause you to doubt the love of God. But when you have that inner witness, no matter what happens, you know, you have peace with God. Hello? There is no more friction between me and my God. This is not on my account because I now stand in faith. This faith is what Christ Jesus has done on my behalf on the cross of Calvary. He canceled the written code and the things that stood opposed to me. He canceled them. So between me and God, there is no issue. Christ paid the price. Ask me why he did it. I don't know why. But he did it anyway. Do you know why? It's beyond human reasoning because if within human relationship it's difficult and it's really for anyone to die for a righteous man. But we were not righteous. We were not godly. We were unrighteous. We were sinners. We were ungodly. We were God's enemies. Yet, he caused it at the right time. God demonstrated his love. And that is why we rejoice in suffering because what he has done for me. So Paul also comes in Romans 8 and he says, the present sufferings that we go through cannot even be compared with the glory awaiting us. I believe that our mother here departed if she's given the option to come back to this earth, I strongly know, I believe strongly that he will say, she will say no. She will say no. Knowing the kind of peace, rest that she finds herself in. And I did die me. I need no other argument. It is enough that Jesus died. Verse 3 says, not only so, but we also glory in suffering because we know that. So he's now giving us answers as why we rejoice in suffering. He says, we know that suffering produces perseverance. Suffering produces what? Perseverance. And perseverance here means persistence in doing something despite difficulty. Persistence in holding on to your faith. Continue your life as a Christian, holding on to Jesus, doing all the good stuff that he wants you to do, living your life as a child of God, maintaining a saving relationship with God, holding on to your salvation. Despite difficulties, you continue in it. You know, Satan may want to buffet you so that you throw away your confidence, but you know, you know, you know that he has loved you and that he has secured your future. 
Christ's death on the cross has guaranteed us a future with God. I know this. So when suffering comes, it tells me to persevere. Move on. Hello? To move on. Move on. Because I want to achieve that final glorification. Perseverance is the ability to pursue a goal or passion over time and stick with it. If we encounter obstacles or setbacks, we still move on. We move on. We move on. We move on. Because as the spirit lives in us and continues to minister God's love, he brings to us what I call the five much moles of God's love. The five much more of God's love. Can we say it? All right. What are they? Number one, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we are introduced to the much more of deliverance from wrath. Romans chapter 5 verse 9. Can we go there? Romans chapter 5 verse 9. Romans 5 9. Since we have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? So that is the first much more. Since we have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Which means no matter who you are, you, you, can, you, you, may, you may falter here and there, but if you continue to remain in him, you shall be saved from his wrath because you have been justified by his blood. Hallelujah. So God will not go back, but you must remain in him. The second one is the much more of preservation by his resurrection life. Verse 10. Verse 10. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? What life is he talking about here? This is not the life before his death, but life after death. His resurrected life, the glorified Jesus, the one who continues to intercede for us. He died and he rose again. So we, even if we die because he has an indestructible life, a resurrected life, the first fruit of those who shall fall asleep. I know that even if I die, I shall be saved through his life. Praise God. The third one is the much more of the gift of grace. Much more of the gift of grace. Verse 15. Let's move on to verse 15. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died, by the trespass of the one man. How much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man Jesus Christ overflow to many. And this is where we also draw strength. In spite of what I go through, I can still pray that God sustain me. Paul had afflictions. He prayed and God said, my grace is sufficient and my strength is made perfect so he says then i will rejoice because even in my weakness i know i am strong because there is an overflowing grace i pray that god will cause his grace to overflow you need the much more of his grace the next one is the much more of the believers reign in life. Verse 17. Verse 17. For if by the trespass of the one man. Death reigned through that one man. How much more. Would those who receive God's abundant provision. Of grace. And of the gift of righteousness. Reign in life. You see. So now. You receive the grace. The provision of grace. And says how much more. Would those who receive God's abundant provision of grace. Of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man. Which means he would give us the ability to master our circumstances. May you receive that ability. This is what brings the difference between the Christian and the non-Christian. They may go through the same situation 
But you see, one is reacting differently. One way, another is re as if the Christian walks as if there is nothing wrong. Hello? You ask, is everything all right? He says, oh yeah, by the grace of God. Amen. Meanwhile, somebody is just cursing. And another, the same, the same, I mean, two people, they have similar situation. One is moving on as if there is nothing wrong. You think we dance around because there is nothing wrong? Praise God. Hallelujah. You think it's all cozy. <laughs> but when one is weeping and wailing and doesn't know what to do, another is just moving on. Another is moving on. Why? Because we reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. May you master your circumstances in the name of Jesus. Because there is an overflowing grace. The fifth one is the much more of pure grace. Verse 20. Verse 20. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. But which sin increase? Grace increase all the more. All the more. Now let me conclude for time's sake. You see, this is the same thought expressed in Romans chapter 8, verse 15 to 39. Let's read that and then I will pray with you. Please bear with me. Verse 15, Romans 8, 15. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Which spirit is he talking about? When did you receive it? When you place faith in Jesus. And remember, it is the same spirit that continues to minister God's love in your heart, correct? And he said, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship and by him you cry, Abba, Father. Hmm? Let's read on. The spirit himself testified with our spirit that we are God's children. So you know that you're a child of God. Hello? Yeah. Yeah. The blows will come, but you still know you're a child of God. <laughs> you have bad dreams, but you still know you're a child of God. You may be struck by sickness, but you still know you're a child of God. You may lose a loved one, but you still know you're a child of God. You pray. Things may not happen the way you want, but you still know you are a child of God. How do you know? Because the spirit inside of you is telling you, you know, you are a child of God. Satan may want to tell you there's something wrong with the family. But the spirit says, you are a child of God. Praise God. That's what Satan has been doing. If God really loved you, he would have told you to eat everything. He did this to our first parents. But they lacked that understanding but thank god through jesus christ we know that we are children of god now if we are children of god then heirs heirs of god and co heirs with christ if indeed we share in his so we share in his share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory as if to suggest that the gateway to glory is suffering otherwise Apart from only two people who have been translated into heaven, everybody has gone through death to enter into God's presence. And death is not something pleasant. Correct? But when you understand this, Paul will say, me to live is Christ and to die is gain. The spirit himself testified with our spirit that we are God's children. Yes? Yes, yes, yes. Read on please. Now, if we are children, now you've gone back. Go to 18. Consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that we will, be, will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope. 
that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning us in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, we have the first fruit of the spirit. We ourselves, who have the first fruit of the spirit, we also do, do what? Inwardly, as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship. This adoption to sonship is talking about the glorified body that we wear when Christ returns. But he says we grow inwardly, but we still wait. We wait in hope for our adoption into sonship. And he explained the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope, we are well saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know how we ought to pray, but uh, the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And we who searches and he who searches our heart knows the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Yes, read on. Let's jump to verse 38 and 39 for time's sake. 38. For I am convinced. Can you read this with me? For I am Hold on. Hold on. Can you go back to verse 36? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are also considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all this, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am, let's read now. Uh-huh. Oh, hallelujah. When you get to this point, that you become convinced that God has loved you and that nothing can separate you from God's love, you would stand strong as a Christian. And the things that he has mentioned, many things, I am convinced that neither death nor anything else in all creation, uh, verse 38, I want to pick some of the things. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, mm -hmm, neither height nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. I pray that this message has brought you to this level of conviction. Amen. Hello? Because that is the objective. Is to bring us to a level of conviction that we know that God has loved us. And that there is nothing that would separate us from the love of God. Not even death. So when death occurs, you are still secured in him. Amen. Because what the love of God has brought to us is salvation. Death cannot destroy salvation. The saved shall always be saved. May the Lord bless you.